Now um, we are going to turn to our main attraction. Exactly. Of the the I know we are going to talk to Leon Nixon and uh, January Lavoie about racing audiobooks. And our first guest is Leon Nixon. Leon Nixon is a professional. Oh, you know what? Really quickly, don't forget to submit your questions if you have any in the Q and A window, not in the chat, because as you can see, it goes by really fast. Okay, back to the description. Uh, Leon Nixon is a professional actor, director, playwright, and filmmaker. He has been a professional audiobook narrator since 2016. A Los Angeles native, Leon has directed and performed in short films and theater performances in dramatic and comedic roles. He is an improviser trained in Los Angeles and Chicago and is part of a group that appears in the Guinness Book of World Records for longest continuous improv show at 150 hours. While um, holding six tennis balls in your <laughs> in mouth. <his> mouth. <laughs> Leon was also uh, uh, a police officer for 30 years, the last nine of which he was a captain which I actually didn't know until just right before the show. So that is fascinating. Welcome, Leon. Leon. Hello, everyone. Oh, listen to that mellifluous voice. <laughs> mellifluous, I love it. Mellifluous. Yeah. Hi. Uh, that's Thanks the beauty of being, on, for being on. Huh? Oh, thank, no, thank you for having me. Thanks for the invitation. You're welcome. That's yeah. Great to have you, friend. What? I'm sorry? Th that was the beauty. You said that's the beauty of... Oh, uh, that's the beauty of being an audiobook narrator. You get to learn wonderful words like mellifluous. I know, right? Hmm. Mellifluous. Yeah, it there's is a pickup for or, you. Or um, erstwhile, Suzanne. Erstwhile. Mm -hmm. yep. mm. I know, I'm just full of big words tonight. Yeah, I lots of big it. words. Awesome. Uh, well, Leon, seriously, thank you for being with us. Uh, it's always, uh, always great to be in your company, and at least uh, virtually in this case. Um, so one of the things we wanted to talk about is um, let's start with your experience with the audiobook industry thus far. Uh, what have you experienced? And, and meaning, I mean, directly as it relates to audiobooks and race, um, any experiences you want to share with everyone? Um, you know what? All good. How's that? <laughs> Love it. Good. All good. I, um, look, everybody has been absolutely wonderful. From the, from the word go, everyone has been wonderful. Um, I, and it's weird for me because I come from a field, I come from an area that's so insular, um, you know, you hear, you hear in the news about the thin blue line, you know, don't cross the thin blue line. And, and so, you know, cops have a tendency to sort of circle the wagons when they feel attacked. And, and so it's all about us versus them. But when I came to this field, everyone has been so warm and so welcoming. People that don't even know me, you know, and didn't know me, helped me. And I am eternally grateful and you know, I could name names, but if I start naming names and I forget somebody, then somebody would be <laughs> mad at me. So I'll just, the people that have helped me, I thank personally, and they know who they are. But I can't tell you if I'm not, not just, you know, black folks, of course, black folks help me too, but, but male, female, all races, people have been super helpful. This is by far the most giving, most wonderful community professionally that I have ever seen. That's lovely. Yeah. I think if you're a nice person, it goes a long way. That helps, you know, that helps. I, well, when I, when I started, I was, um, I was told you got to go to APAC and you have to meet people. And so what I did was I called on a lot of the experiences that I had as a police officer. And one of the things I learned early on was keep your mouth shut um, when you're new, right? Keep your mouth shut, speak when you're spoken to, take tons of notes. And even as I promoted, I, I made a note to myself of take notes of everything and then read them later because things jump out at you that you become accustomed to later on and don't see. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went to my first APAC. I took tons of notes. I met a ton of people, but I didn't really say much. And the people that I end up meeting, I end up seeing again next year and seeing again and again and talking to and just building relationships with. Yeah. And it's just, it just helps to be a nice person without an agenda, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah. And what I noticed here, okay, okay. In the police world, if you don't mind indulging me for a hot second. No, in, the poli in the police world, when someone wants to get ahead in the police world, you study and you take, you take an exam, right? You want to be a sergeant, you take a sergeant's exam, you want to be a lieutenant and so forth. So when I became a captain, I had to take the captain's exam and an oral board and the whole nine yards. Well, when exam time comes around, suddenly all the policy manuals disappear suddenly people start backstabbing each other. And this is big scramble to try and make yourself seen and heard and known. And the, the manuals disappear because you study from them. So now if I want the manual, if I don't get to it first, someone has taken it home and I won't see it again until after the exam, mm. okay? In this field, 
I mean, people that don't even know me have said, have recommended me for jobs and people that know me have recommended me and I've recommended other people. It's like, this is one big community of people who just want to see other people do well. And in the very beginning, it was a little foreign to me. I'm like, okay, wait, who are you people? And why are you so nice to me? <laughs> what's going on here? There's, there's way too much going on. What, what's, what's, what's the catch? But what I learned is that there is no catch. Just be a nice person. Don't be a jerk. I won't use the other four letter word that starts with a D, but don't be a jerk. <laughs> Um, we use just, it all the time. <laughs> all, all the time. <laughs> but I mean, you know, I mean, but be a nice person and be genuine. And, you know, and like when I went to my first APAC, I just talked to people. I mean, I, I talked to people who I didn't even know. And come, come to find out, there are people that I have been listening to for years. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, that's who that was. And I didn't even know. But A, I didn't talk about audiobooks. I didn't talk about acting. I wasn't trying to promote myself. Hi, I'm Leon. I'm a new narrator. Uh, none of that. It was just, let's talk about wine. Let's talk about dogs. Let's talk about family. Let's talk about cars. We can talk about sunsets. I don't care. We can talk about anything but why we're all here. We all know why we're here. So let's not talk about that. I want to know yeah. who you are as a person. I want to get to know you as a person. And what I feel here is that people are genuinely interested in me as a person and so when I have those conversations, I feel like I'm connecting with a human being and not someone who's trying to, to get at me, right? As right. a captain, you're the boss, right? I controlled a budget. I had, at one, at one point, like 60 people reporting to me in one division. And, and I had a bunch of 24-hour 24, 24 responsibility over a bunch of stuff, a bunch of highly sensitive stuff. And so when someone saw me coming, they were automatically nice to me because I'm the captain, right? They're nice to me. They're not my friend. They pretend to be my friend, but they're not my friend. And I knew that. Here, I'm not a captain. I'm just this guy trying to do the best that I can acting wise. And hopefully I produce a good product. And people are not trying to get something from me. And it took me a little while to kind of get my head around that but now I kind of get it and I'm like oh wow these people are really cool they really care about me the person not me the person that can do something for you mm -hmm. and that's why I dig this so very much that's lovely I mean there's that even playing field but you're talking a lot about the competition aspect in the other world it was very cutthroat and here it's more generous I mean there is the the technical difference where you've got a chain of command in one place and you know, people trying to climb a ladder, whereas here you've got a lot of independent contractors vying for work in different ways. But what you've said uh, goes hand in hand with so much of what we talked about in past episodes about how to conduct yourself, you know, at these events and, you know, building and cultivating relationships, how to conduct yourself in social media um, and being a nice person and putting positive things out there and don't be a dick, I'll say it for you. So it's been like a recurring theme uh, on the show. And it's so nice to hear you've had that experience in such a positive way. Yeah, but it took me a while since we're on this, this episode. It took me a while to, to find the black people. Let me just say that out loud. Mm -hmm. When I went to my first APAC, I looked around. I'm like, where are the brothers and sisters at? What's going mm -hmm. on here? Who are you? Where am I? You know, <laughs> and coming up in my old profession, I was very often the only one in the room. Very often the only one in the room. And so when I spoke, you know, sometimes, depending on who they were, sometimes they would dismiss it because I don't want to hear from that black guy. He don't know what he's talking about. They don't know me. They don't know my background. They don't know my education level. They don't, they don't know my training. They don't know any of that stuff about me. And by the way, I have more education, more training, and a better background than most people in the room. But they don't know that. They just see my skin, see who I am, and like, yeah, 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 whatever. Um, and so I look for my people. I just do. When I walk into a room, I look where the black people at because I want to feel like I belong and I want to feel like I'm with people who get me, if that makes any sense. Oh, yeah. And it's totally relevant to, I'm sure, where we're going with this in terms of doing projects. You mean in terms of shared experience, I take it. In terms of shared experiences, I want to see someone that looks like me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I want to see people in the room that look like me because I know that they will get me. My experiences, you know, we probably have similar experiences. Black folks, look. Even as a cop, I was pulled over. And to this day, as a retired captain, I still get pulled over. I still get hurt. Look, I got pulled over by someone who knew me, who I knew this kid growing up. I remember when he was 16 years old, he became a police officer. We know the same people. He profiled me, he pulled me over. And then when he got to the car, he saw it was me. You could have bought him for a nickel. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, 
it happens all the time. But so when I walk into a room, I'm looking. So when I walked into APAC, I'm like, oh, where are the people? But it took me a little while, but I've connected with some folks, fantastic folks, not only talented, but just good human beings. And uh, that makes me feel good. No one's trying to get anything from anyone. We're just one big community. And I like that. Um, yeah. And so that kind of, that kind of makes me happy and it makes me want to, it makes me want to stay. Well, we did discuss um, the idea of, of casting and what you would like to see in terms of when casting and, and, and having more, uh, more of a mixed pool of people to choose from. What would you say about that? I have been following a lot of the comments on line social media and people have their definite opinions about that. My opinion, cast someone who has the experience to do the job. I get that we're all actors and some people will say, Hey, as long as you can, you know, deliver the performance, who cares? I don't agree with that. I just don't agree with that. Right. If you have, look, we're casting an experience. I, we like I'm casting somebody people that are casting are ca casting someone who has the experience to be able to deliver the job, not just the technical ability, but the, ex the experiential part of it. Right. I could never narrate a book about the Holocaust. I could never do it. And I wouldn't do it. I could never do a book about a first person um, memoir about internment camps. I could never do it. Now, technically, can I do it? Can I deliver the performance? Sure. Can I come up with the emotion and the substitution and do it? Yeah, of course. But is it right to do? No. And I'm not the person to do that because I don't have the experience. What I would like to see, I would like to see from the narrator's point of view to be sensitive to what the material is, right? If you have um, a third person limited, and they're relaying this story of experiences and their experiences about people in the black community or experiences about their home life coming up. Yeah, you can probably do some substitution. You can figure it out and you can do it. But should you? No, because in that story, there are other people that are speaking as well. Other people with their own experiences that they relate. It may be tangentially involved. They may be, you know, a day player. They kind of come and go. Um, but you have this continuous thread. And there are people that come up that have these experiences that matter. And so what I would like to see is people just be a little bit sensitive. Could you do it? Yes. Should you? Probably not. From, um, from the publisher standpoint, I think, we could, I think we could solve the problem, if it is a problem, of trying to get more people of color to, to do the job. And I'm looking forward to the New York Times discussion as well. But I, I think that we can solve that problem by getting more black authors, you know? And I think if we get more people of color coming in, black, Hispanic, I'm black, so I'm gonna talk about black folks, black, Hispanic, Asian, people of color with those experiences that write about them, they're writing their point of view, they're writing their experiences, fiction, nonfiction, whatever, they're writing it. You can't help but have a narrator deliver that story, right? I just, you know, look, look, my grandfather was born in the 1800s. And I'm sure he's got some experiences that he can't tell me. But if he wrote his memoir and I would be the one to narrate it, I would love to do it. But should a white narrator narrate my grandfather's story? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. So I think you should be sensitive to the voice of the author, sensitive to the nature of the material, and then ask yourself the question, yes, I could do this, but should I do this? Am I doing the author's words and intentions justice by doing this story? Yes, we wanna get paid. Yes, we wanna take as many projects as we can because we wanna make our health insurance or we wanna make our mortgages or whatever. But what is right to do in terms of telling the story, right? And Leon, I think of it so like this, if so I'm on, clear. let me, yeah. uh, let me interrupt you there just only because I want to ask this question. Of course. Um, and, and your point is obviously well taken and I, I can't imagine anyone disagreeing with it. I certainly don't. The question though is, are you seeing that that's not happening? I mean, are you seeing uh, first person black historical memoirs not being recorded by black narrators? Is that something you want to see changed? Are you seeing uh, what you're calling for not happening currently? 
I'm not in a, I'm not in a position to say that because I haven't okay. listened to everything. Uh, the limited amount of things that I have listened to because you know time is a limitation. I can only listen to so much. I have not experienced that because those are not the kind of books that I listen to, right? I listen, I, I have my own favorite narrators like most people, like a lot of people. I have my own favorite genres that I listen to and I have not experienced that. I've not heard it personally. You just wanna make sure that that I, is the case. Yes. Got it. Is that okay? Of course, yeah. Great, great. Um, you know, while I'm here, I'm out of, you asked me what I thought and, and that's what I think. I haven't 100%. heard it. I have nothing to complain about. Um, Got it. That's what I, I wanted to be clear about. You know, it's, it's uh, uh, because obviously, like I said, we're on board with you. I just want to make clear for us and for our audience, is this something you've seen that you say, hey, this needs to change or this is just what you want to support and what you want to see more of out there. I just wanted to make that clarification. Thank you. So we also talked, um, and I think this is something this is something we had a, a decent conversation about before, but um, it is always a bit sensitive when a person of one race is trying to voice a character of another race and trying not to make that a stereotype. Um, what would you say about people who are trying to play a person of a different race, like a white person trying to be, trying to play a black person? <laughs> These are just people. They're not characters and I know that sometimes when we make references to folks in the book we say well I'm playing this character I'm playing an Asian character I'm playing a British character these are people right when an author writes a story if I'm it, okay all right if we're sitting around a fire and I'm telling you a story I'm telling you a story and I'm doing all all the voices I'm telling you a story about people and it doesn't change when you get to a book I remember I'll tell you this because I've heard it. I've heard it. I've only heard it once in a book and it made me cringe a little bit when someone tried to do the, what they thought was the black voice. I remember walking into, I was a brand new cop as like eight months on the job and I walked into the locker room and the cops on the other side of the lockers were talking, all white cops. I was one of, you know, a handful in this particular situation. And they were talking about their experiences, you know, blacks and Mexicans, and they were talking a lot of, you know, stuff about their experiences, and it wasn't all good. And they were mocking the way that they talk. And it upset me. And so I stuck my head around the corner and I, and I, and I looked at them and they looked at me and said, oh, Nixon, no, no, we're not talking about you. You know, you're not like those other blacks. <laughs> and that stuck with me and it upsets me. So when I, I, so when I hear people try and do that and I, I'm sensitive to it already, I only heard it once in a project um, and it was, you know, probably a new narrator, nobody that I know or had heard of, but probably a new narrator, I don't know, but I'd heard it and it made me cringe. So my advice, if you have to voice someone of color and you're not someone of color, don't try and throw on what you think is the black accent. Don't do that because it's insulting. Just make that person a real person having a real experience in your own voice. And I trust me, as, an, as a, not only a narrator, but as a consumer of audiobooks too, as an audience member, we get it. I get it. I, I get it. I get it. You know what I mean? And that's all I ask. Great you advice. Know, We've talked um, about that, that difference between yeah. portraying a character versus a caricature. Leon, you and I have talked about this personally. You told me, in fact, in our last session, our... Um, be my own dialect coach, which was a fan. By the way, here's a commercial for PJ's Be No, own don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, what you told me was, you told me commit, don't comment. Yeah, I live by that. I really try. And to if that. anybody, if you ever run into a question, if you're in doubt, say, com say, tell yourself, commit, don't comment. And if you just commit to what the story is all about, who is that person in that situation? It's a real human being. It's a you know, real human being having yeah. a real experience in that moment. Just live that and you'll be just fine. Yeah, brilliant. I try us. and do that. I don't, you know, look, I come across, you know, in, in my work, I come across women and I come across men and I come across gay characters and I come across um, people that speak different languages and they're just people. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be my version of a gay character. I'm, I, don't, I don't do that. Mm -hmm. That person is a person with real feelings, having a real experience. And my job is to try and live that the best that I can. And I just hope that other people that are not of the person that they're trying to share, portray, 
they remember these are just real people. And anything less, and it, if you're playing, okay, actors, if you're playing an idea, then you're not doing your job. You have, to li- you have to live, the ex- have the experience in order to do it justice. But if you're playing the idea, you might as well not do it because no one is going to get it. And you'll turn, you turn me off and you probably turn off other people too. What do you think though? Um, because I'm, I'm thinking of a specific book I listened to and the narrator did accents that made it clear who was in it, but I thought it was incredibly convincing. And I was able to see the characters so well. And one of them was a black woman and it was just the, the smallest touch of, a, of some sort of, you know, hint of who she was, but I saw her and I knew what she looked like. Do you see value in doing it if you can do it well? Or Absolutely. It... Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, if you can do it. Um, I said I wasn't going to say names, but and I won't. But there are some narrators, and you guys all know who they are. Some do characters, you know, really, really well. Some say I don't do characters. And even the narrator or narrators that I can think of that say they don't do characters, the slightest little bit of something I can see it and I get it and I and I don't think it's so much the act of changing your voice or the act of tossing a little lilt here and there what I feel like is that actor giving that performance has the experience of that person and I feel like it just comes out once again they're they're honestly portraying a human as opposed to a voice they're playing a person not a voice it's uh I think that really becomes that distinguishing characteristic doesn't it it ma- yes, and it matters. Yep. It matters. It matters. Look, it matters in my work. I try and do it too. It matters. You can oh. tell when somebody's faking it, right? You can tell when somebody thinks that they're, you know, trying to be, you know, the his- the Hispanic, you know, store owner or whatever. You can tell when they're trying to throw something in there, as opposed to who that person is in that moment and having that experience. You can right. tell. And the only thing I ask, since we're on this topic, the only thing that I ask, um, and again, I will say I haven't heard it i think i've heard it once i told you that but one thing i ask for people that are considering doing a project that has multiple people that are not of their own origin um it's just remember that they're people that's all and i'm gonna do it and hopefully others will you know will do it too and we'll see there you go once in a while there's a challenge just because this is really great actionable stuff i mean really good tips that are takeaways for everyone listening so i think that's why we're spending an extra minute here on this but um on that topic, once in a while, we get the challenge where a character is written in, you know, the dialogue is written in vernacular or dialect. So, again, I mean, I, my answer to that is being connected to who the person is, obviously, as we keep going around that point. But what are your thoughts when someone is faced with, it's a white narrator, the, the protagonist is white, uh, first person perhaps, or even third person limited, but you have some of these minority characters in the script whose dialogue is written in dialect. How do you handle that? Do it. Do it and just don't think about it. Just do it. Don't try and say, well, this is a black person saying this in this particular dialect, whether it's Southern or broken English or whatever it might be. Just just do it. But don't try and don't try and do it as a black person. Commit. Commit. Don't comment. All right. Susan. Does that make make sense? Of course. Uh, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Well, I don't want to wrap up our conversation about about narrating, but I also don't want to let this opportunity go by without asking you what your perspective is as a former police officer slash captain um, about what's happening in the world. Hmm. Black lives matter. Mm -hmm. That's it. Black lives matter. Look, I have seen firsthand how police treat people of color. And I don't like it. And what I try to do as I rose through the ranks is try and help people as best I can and try and offset that with whatever I could do within my sphere of influence. What's going on right now is people are tired, right? Look, I've experienced it myself. People are tired of being tired. They're tired of being held down. They're tired of being looked at sideways. Listen, you guys know me. Do I look threatening to you? (laughs) Not in the least. Do you guys look look at my look at that? Who's that guy? He's got earrings on. <laughs> Who is this guy? I don't ha- I'm not I, I don't look like a threatening guy. I had my very first uh, purse clutching experience a couple of years ago in Kirkland, Washington. 
right? A, I walk into an elevator in a business office. I walk into an elevator. A woman walks ahead of me, older, like middle-aged-ish um, white woman. She walks in, she pushes the button. I walk in and I push the button for my floor and I can see out of the corner of my eye, she shifts her purse from one side to the side that's furthest away from me. And, you know, it's, it's insulting. I get it though, but I don't like it. And that's just my experience. People have had much worse. I'm not trying to minimize anybody else's negative experiences or even, even George Floyd. Any, I'm not trying to minimize any. All I'm saying is that people are tired of being targeted because of what they look like. They can't control that. And so the only thing that we can do is educate each other, right? When you know better, you do better. And all learning is based on prior learning, prior experience. So now that we know where we've come from, and we're talking to people and thank you for putting this together so we can talk about this and get it out there. And you know, we know where we're going and we can hopefully change that mindset. But what's going on right now, look, Black Lives Matter. And as long as people are peacefully protesting, they should. And I don't agree with them tearing up stuff, but I do agree that there should be some peaceful protests. I do agree that we should raise the awareness. I do agree that we should get to the point where we don't have to talk about diversity. We shouldn't have to talk about diversity. We should just talk about ability. And that would make me very happy. So I support what's going on right now. Yes, Black Lives Matter. I support that. Uh, I support peaceful protests, not destruction of property or injury of people. I support make, heightening awareness. I support making sure that we are all, all of our voices are heard and we are all respected. And that's the thread that goes through what I'm saying here about characters, about how we treat each other in this industry, about how I have been treated in this industry. I feel respected. I feel heard. And I hope that when we can get to the point where we all feel respected and heard. Thank you for that, Leon. Um, to, to wrap up, um, you've had such wonderful things to say about our industry, which mm -hmm. is great. Is there anything you want to see changed? Is there anything that's not working for you? Is there anything that, uh, you know, the alarm bell needs to be rung? No, no, no. My, my interaction with, um, my fellow narrators, with y'all, with publishers, with, you know, my interaction has all been positive. Um, and a lot of that is because I'm intentional about the things that I do. Um, and I'm trying to make sure that my interactions with people are smooth. I don't have anything that I've seen that needs changing right now. I would like to see more black authors. I would love to see if, if, if I could give advice to anyone and who am I to tell, you know, publishers or casting how to do their job. It's their choice, right? They're going to choose who's right for the job. They're going to choose who's reliable for the job. They're going to chill. They're going to choose who sells, right? Who's right. Who's reliable and who sells. I, th I think that makes sense. If I'm casting, that's what I would consider. And so I would like to see more black authors because I think that the experience is one that needs to be shared. And once we get that experience out there and once we get that information out there and once other people see the black experience, it will be less, I think, it will be less frightening to people because a lot of this is fear and fear of the unknown. So I would like to see more people of color published, uh, more people of color in audio. And uh, that would make me very happy. But it's not a criticism and it's not negative. I would just like to see more of that. Thank you. Thank you for your perspective. Leon Nixon, tell us something good. Oh, um, can I share two things good? Sure. Come I, on. Make, I want Suzanne to feel like she's supported. Thank you. <laughs> um, num num number one, I, I had one thing, but something else came up. Today, I went to Harold and Bell's. Oh, my God. If you guys are in L.A., you roll through L.A., we're going to roll up to Harold and Bell's and get some good old Southern cooking, some jambalaya. I got some Harold and Bell's today, some jambalaya, and some beignets, which I hadn't had in a long time. <gasps> oh, mm. I love beignets fantastic that it's just it's not good for you right no. sugar and fried foods not so don't have it all the time depends on Man. your definition of good for you so good oh, <laughs> so good so good and then the other thing that makes me laugh every time it comes out if you guys are not following randy rainbow you're missing out <laughs> what is randy rainbow oh my god he, he does parody videos of what's going on politically in the news he's making fun of all the things happening in the news um, and it's like one big musical. It's it, if he, he satisfies my need for a musical during the pandemic. It's spent. <laughs> watch Randy Rainbow. I follow him on, you know, Instagram, social media, Facebook, whatever. He's fantastic. 
he just he satisfies he gives me my musical fix. So there we go. Um, Harold and Bells. So if you guys are in LA or coming to LA, you hit me up. And we'll roll over to Harold and Bells and get some good old Southern greasy fattening food. It's not good for you, but delicious. The trio and, just uh, um, put up a, and, a link to Harold and Bells. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and Randy Rainbow for your musical fix, your musical Thank parody you. comedy fix. <laughs> Fantastic. Nice. Leon Nixon, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Leon. Thank you it for was inviting really, me. really valuable. I mean, far more valuable than I even would have expected because I didn't know what you're going to say. And it turns out you were amazing. Oh, wow. Thank you. So Suzanne had very low expectations of you, Leon. That <laughs> that's not what I was trying to say. <laughs> yeah, that's how it came out, though. So I know, well but done. we never know what's going what's gonna to come out with our guests. I know. Sometimes it's so they're great. stunning, and it's sometimes awesome. they're, you know, Leon, this is totally one big thought, improv show as well. We exactly. thought you'd suck so bad, <laughs> and it turned out you didn't. It was no. amazing. I mean, it was such a roll of the dice bringing you on. We had no idea. Um, good. Thank you, my friend. It is always, like I said, great to be with you, and now in this environment, along with all the others we've shared. Uh, thank you so much for being part of the show, really. It is my pleasure. Thank, thank you, you for Stick around in that uh, audio green room there and uh, play around in the chat. Do us a favor, make fun of Michelle Cobb while you're in there, because we don't no, get the chance to do that. I like Michelle. Michelle's Well, that's awesome. nice, but she doesn't but she like makes us, fun of us, so we need, we need some, somebody defending we us. We need somebody on our that. team. So, yeah. She's one of the good guys. Uh, yeah. uh, to, 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 right. Okay. okay. Yeah. Like we said, <laughs> sure. it depends on your definition of good for you. Okay. <laughs> so here we go. Thank you, Leon. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, January Lavoie is an Atlanta-based theater, television, and voice actress. She's an audiophile magazine, Golden Voice, as of last year in 2019. Has an extensive body of work in both narration and commercial voiceover in addition to her stage and TV work. Uh, hundreds of audiobook titles to her credit. She's received more than two dozen earphones awards, 16 Audi Award nominations, including four wins. I kind of feel like that's got to be a typo in the bio because I was at her table at the Audis last year and I think she had four wins that night. Uh, <laughs> she was named Publishers Weekly's uh, Audiobook Narrator of the Year in 2013. Proud member of Equity, sag after a passionate about her volunteer work at the 52nd Street Project in Hell's Kitchen. Actually, it'd be interesting to hear about that now that she's moved to Atlanta. She's a full-time faculty member now in the Department of Theater and Dance at Emory University. You know where you love her. It's January Lavoie. Welcome, uh, January. Hello. How are oh, you doing? It's, such a, it's so wonderful to have you on. Oh, thanks, guys. I appreciate you taking the time to do this for all of us. And man, Leon Nixon, thanks right? for giving me the hardest fact in the world to follow, but I will try Leon. to exceed Suzanne's basement level expectations. <laughs> oh, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> And by the way, January, you also have a mellifluous voice. Oh, God, thank you. If you hadn't said that, I was going to quit tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> has has mo mellifluous been chosen as the drinking game word tonight, by the way? There have been a few. There have been Zeitgeist was mentioned. I yeah, used Zeitgeist were... earlier yeah. in the show, yeah, yeah. But I think we haven't really said it very much, have no, we? No, no. Well, uh, Michelle just called drink when, when I said mellifluous. Oh, there you go. Apparently, it's been selected. So yeah. mellifluous, mellifluous, mellifluous. <laughs> All right. Um, so so let's start off uh, January. Just give us a little overview on your feelings about what's going on. Let's set things up. Yeah. Um, so to your point from earlier, PJ, that New York Times article started being researched, I think, in January. The, uh, yeah. the author had reached out to me in January, late January, maybe early February. And then uh, so it took a long time because, of course, apparently something happened along the lines of a global pandemic in between. Um, and so you know, I was sort of waiting and seeing if it was ever going to surface, and then it did. And, you know, as we've already said, it surfaced in the midst of another experience that we didn't know we were going to be having as a country. Um, and so, you know, in the past month, five, six weeks, I've been asked by a few people to weigh in with my thoughts and feelings um, from the university to the narration community, a few podcasts I've done. And Ah, uh, you know, my heart is broken, um, but that's not new. I guess just my heart is broken out loud um, in a way that I have not necessarily felt confident uh, being as forward with my thoughts and feelings um, in the world before. And so it's this odd sort of, you know, knife's edge between like, rage and grief and also joy and relief and hope and possibility. Um, both things are existing in almost equal measure at this time. 
So it's, uh, it's quite, quite, a, quite a time to be alive. So we were talking about the New York Times article, which of course we already said you were in, um, and you were talking about a specific term that the writer used that you would have preferred he didn't. Yeah, so when we were initially having our conversations, um, he had mentioned the concept of colorblind casting and I, I did stop him and that, that sort of made its way into the article. But at the time I asked him, you know, if he wouldn't mind replacing that term with a, a term that's been used certainly in the theater for a few years now, which is where I first heard it, uh, which is color conscious casting instead of colorblind casting. Because I do not want you to cast me in something because you pretend you have your eyes closed and you cannot see what I am or who I am. I want you to choose to cast me in something because you see who I am, what I am, what I have to offer, what my experience is, how I can be. As Leon was saying, you know, it's our responsibility to be a custodian of the experience, right? And certain people have a higher level of intimacy with certain experiences than others. It, there's no doubt that as an actor, it's my job to inhabit whatever is put in front of me, right? That is the job. And I will do that and I can do it. And but there are certain jobs that other actors are going to be able to do better than I do. So for me, um, and I would encourage everyone listening and I would encourage everyone in our community, because I think in particular as narrators, we can really get at this uh, in, a different, in a different kind of way um, to, think about, to think about it as color conscious um, and, and what that means and what the experience, how it, how it enriches something. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Um, well, I think a big part of the conversation I wanted to have with you initially was um, asking what I can do. And when we talked, you, in a very nice way, without necessarily referencing me, <laughs> were kind of talking about other friends and saying, you know, it's not my job <laughs> to like educate you. You can go out and educate yourself. You did not say this to me, um, <laughs> but to other people. Um, and in that, I have been trying to educate myself. Um, and there were a few articles I came across, and I wanted to get your opinion on a couple things. Um, <sighs> making this more about our industry, one of the things I saw was to um, decolonize your library mm -hmm. that was the term mm -hmm. and to uh for every every book you pick by a white author pick a person of color author mm -hmm. um, and i was thinking we can we can institute that with narrators as well and what was interesting to me because you know one thing we have to do uh all of us is address our own bias and recognize that we have it and that doesn't make us a bad person necessarily but it, you know a good person tries to improve um and one of the things they said was don't pigeonhole authors of color. They can do more than talk about race. Just pick something from your favorite genre written by authors of color. And mm -hmm. I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, well, as a resource that I'd love to offer, is it okay if I plug somebody's podcast on here? Sure. Okay. So I did an interview um, a few weeks ago with a podcast called Currently Reading, which is hosted by a woman named Katie Cobb. Um, it was actually set up for me through Macmillan because I had just done this Nora Roberts book. And we ended up having conversations about what's, what's topical and what's happening right now. And, and Katie, who is a, a white woman, um, confessed to me that she was glad that I said it in the, in the interview because she and a friend of hers were planning on devoting their next episode to how to be a white ally. And, you know, that always makes me a little nervous. <laughs> um, and, but, you know, I, I liked her and I thought she, she had some, some really wonderful things to say. And so I tuned in the following week. And so I'm just going to say it again. And um, it's the Currently Reading podcast. It's the June 5th episode and it's called Getting Started as a White Ally. And it is essentially very much what you're talking about, but in an even more active way of decolonizing your bookshelf and decolonizing. And they suggest exactly that, that start with a genre you love, you know, don't feel, can you guys hear me? Okay. I'm yeah, getting sure. the, okay. Getting the, your internet is unstable message. Um, start with what you love. If you love sci-fi, trust me, there are black authors writing sci-fi, the best sci-fi you've ever, you know, whether it's Octavia Butler or whoever, romance, historical fiction, nonfiction, it's all there. So you don't even have to go outside of what you like, right? You can just go where you already are. Thank you, Michelle, for uh, putting up that link. Um, 
And it is a wonderful, it's a wonderful attempt by two white women to help other people help themselves without putting the emotional, mental, spiritual burden on people of color. And the way that they do it, it, it its strength lies in both its, its conviction and the knowledge of its own imperfection. And they, they say it many times, um, but it, it's, it's a wonderful uh, effort. And they say, you know, if you have a question, trust us, a black person has written the answer to your question somewhere. They've actually already done the labor. You just have to go and find it without turning to one of your black friends out of convenience and saying, hey, can you tell me where it's out there? you know, let the Googles be your guide. Um, and so I would really, really highly recommend that if folks are interested in doing this kind of work and they talk about how to start this kind of uh, activism in your own friend community, and they also talk very passionately and articulately about how to deal with people in your own life or your own family who are not on board. And it's a painful thing. And I have white relatives that I have had to have these painful conversations with my whole life. And I understand that pain. But it is a question of what amount of risk you as a white ally are willing to assume to make things better. That is the question that people have to ask themselves. You know, we, we've been hearing a lot that phrase, you know, when you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. It doesn't just feel like oppression, though. That, that's sort of like the loftiest thought. It just feels a lot of times like discomfort right? In the past month, I've said things to white friends and well-meaning friends and allies. And I've said, you know, I, I think when they ask me something, I say, well, I think we should do it this way. And then they go, yeah, I'm not comfortable with that. And the reality is your discomfort is part of the problem because you've been allowed to feel so comfortable for so long with things that now we all acknowledge are really, really wrong, right? And so it's going to take some discomfort to overcome that wrongness. And I'd love to also uh, quote Linda Holmes, who many of you know, she's the host of NPR Pop Culture Happy Hour. She, um, she was an audience judge last year. She actually sat at my table. I only got to meet her briefly, but I, I follow her on social media and she's so brilliant and wonderful. Um, and she wrote at the kind of the very beginning of all of this, she wrote this wonderful uh, four tweet sequence. And I just want to, I want to share it because I can't possibly paraphrase her. Linda Holmes, who, uh, in case you don't know, she's a white woman, and she said, um, I think this is a really good time for white people trying to be allies, to carefully source every image you're spreading, every anecdote you're calling inspirational, every this, quote unquote, everything. There's an understandable urge not to be silent. I share it. But listen first to what the black people you trust and follow are saying, feeling, sharing. If you don't follow enough to do that, then you are better off rectifying that and listening first. If something sounds inspirational to you or insightful about race, but it's being circulated in your feed almost entirely by white people, that's a sign that you might need to take another second. Consider it more. Learning not to go entirely with your gut when it comes to what's wise is part of learning your instincts are imperfect no matter what your conscious intentions because of the systemic racism we're all poached in. Mine absolutely are. That's great. It's, it's similar to something I read. I mean, it's a lot more. Uh, she expounded a lot more on it, but it's um, help don't hurt. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, that's, that's, I mean, all of this is, is looking at things from a different perspective than you're, you're accustomed to. And it's uncomfortable. You're right. It is because it's just so different. And we think that we're, allies we think that we're you know lots of people say well i'm not racist but of course you are because that's how you were raised there's no way you can't have an idea of white supremacy there's just isn't so. yeah i mean racism racism is not a feeling right i think like that's when i was growing up and my parents are white right when i was growing up i i felt I thought racism was a bad feeling that people had toward me. And I think that as children, when we first learn about racism, that, that's what it seems like. That's sort of the best way to kind of quantify it, right? And now, you know, we're having all of these conversations about the fact that racism is an, it's not a feeling, right? It's an institution. And that's true, right? It's in our institutions. It's, 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 it's in our government. It's in our, you know, our policing institutions. It's in our schools. It's in, it's in real estate. It's everywhere, right? 
But I don't want to let people completely off the hook by saying racism is an institution and we have to tear it down because I also think that on a personal level, this is what I believe. I think that it's a failure of imagination. And this is again something I think that we can take on as narrators in a way that lots of other people are not as well positioned to do. We have to learn how to imagine better. When you are narrating a book, and I've said this in, in classes that I've taught and, and, and talks that I've given, when you are narrating a book and the race of a character is unspecified, what is your default setting as the narrator? What do you think it is? Are you thinking that 98% of the characters in every book are white if they're unspecified? Well, that's a problem that we have in writing, right? That's a problem in publishing. And as Leon was saying, we need more, more diverse authors, more black authors, but it's also our problem as narrators because if it's unspecified, you get to choose you get to populate that world. So you get to create that world in whatever way you see fit. And I'm not even talking about giving people accents that aren't specified in the book or anything like that. I'm talking about your own imagination. People that world, the way you want to see the world in your own mind. And if your default setting is white people, then maybe your world, your real world needs to change. And I'm not even saying you need to move or quit your job or, you know, what television shows are you watching that are reinforcing that idea that it's a white world, right? What movies are you watching? Again, de decol don't just decolonize your bookshelves, decolonize your Netflix, decolonize your Spotify, whatever. All the media that you consume as a consumer, as a citizen, affects your imagination of how the world is and how it should be. So we have a responsibility as, imagine, as, as, as imaginative creators to put a better version of the world out there. Thank you. Yeah. January, tell us about your experience with the audiobook industry specifically. You know, I can mostly echo, you know, everything Leon said. And what we all know to be true is that this is a kind uh, generous, well-intentioned. Um, I, I, I personally coming from, you know, a, a fairly cutthroat world of, you know, theater and television and stuff in, in New York city for a couple of decades. When I first got into narration, I, I loved the fact that, that I didn't feel that kind of pressure, uh, to compete and that there was enough work to go around and everybody wanted to help each other. And I, I love that. I, I will say, um, I'll give you a very specific example of something that, that could change. So um, I work for Autumn, uh, which some other folks I think uh, t here tonight do and, and some of you know about, um, which is the uh, sort of long form uh, publishing folks that, that record articles for the New York Times and the New Yorker and Rolling Stone and, and what have you. And um, a couple of days after the Christian Cooper incident in Central Park and George Floyd's murder, I got a ping on Slack and they were asking me if I uh, could take a, an article for them, which I, you know, I've been working for them for years and that's just what they do. They say it's an 8,500 word article and it's due this day, can you do it? That's always how it's been. And I took a deep breath and I, I took a little bit of a risk and I, I texted back the producer, I said, uh, I have two questions, you know, uh, what's the length and deadline I need to know for my schedule? And also, does the piece concern violence against black bodies in any way? Because I cannot engage that material right now. And the Slack thread, which never goes quiet, went completely dark for about 20 minutes. <laughs> And, uh, and then they came back and they said, oh, it's about COVID, but uh, we don't have a final yet. And uh, maybe we'll get it by tomorrow and we'll, we'll circle back. And I said, okay, great. And then they came back and they said, actually, it didn't come in on time. We know you have other stuff going on. So I didn't end up doing that. And, you know, I wasn't sure at that moment whether or not I had just made myself uh, problematic, but I didn't care. It was what I needed to do to take care of myself because I really couldn't have done that article at that time. And then about nine days later, I got a, a text from the head of production and she said, um, thank you so much for your message the other day. Uh, it's something we uh, have been thinking about and we've reworked the structure of our offers, making it standard practice to share a brief description of the content when we make an offer. Mm. 
And I thought, man, there's, that's it. And, and all that is to say that I have had to say horrible things in audiobooks. I feel that everyone listening has had to say horrible things in audiobooks, right? Yeah. Either because they came from a character or because we disagreed with the author's perspective, right? Whatever. But because of the way our industry works, do any of us ever have the time to read the book before we <laughs> say yes to it? No, not of course not. That's, yeah, no. But, but I mean, even before we say yes to the job, right? right. I, I read the book before I record it, but I have to say yes to the job first, right? So there's a way in which producers and maybe even the APA can start talking about a policy that takes care of narrators in that way, because it's not just about, uh, you know, black violence against black bodies, but, you know, if, if someone's parent just died after a long illness and then you offer them this wonderful novel about someone's parent dying of a long illness, it's nice to just sort of be able to know what we're getting ourselves into, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's trickier with books because it's a much longer format and, and books tend to go lots of places. But I think that there's a way in which we should be engaging uh, the idea that people have lives outside of the way that they make money <laughs> and the emotional involvement that we are all asked to unleash when we are doing an audiobook. We're asked to go there, right? We were just saying these aren't characters, they're people. And when we're all at our best, we are those people. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to have, I think, um, maybe just a conversation even, I'm not even advocating policy yet, but just a conversation about how, you know, what we ask. I mean, you know, I've done books where I've had to say the N-word 20, 30, 50, 80 times. That's a different kind of day than going into a booth to do a romantic comedy. It's a real different kind of day. And I don't know who's thinking about that, but somebody should be thinking about that. Somebody in the chain of command should be thinking about that. And we should be having those conversations before the narrator has to go into the booth with that book. Mm -hmm. So that's a very specific change you'd like to see. Are there other changes? Again, I mean, I know you said you've had a, also a very positive experience like Leon. Anything else that uh, the industry is not doing that you think they should or anything the industry is, is doing that you would prefer they didn't? You know, I, I have to say I had one extremely positive experience in this realm where a few years ago I had a bad experience with a director uh, doing a book that um, was about women of color and uh, the director was white and we sort of got into an aesthetic conversation in the booth and it, it didn't go well. <laughs> and I just sort of put aside what I thought was wrong about what the director was saying I did what I thought was right. And I didn't say anything for a long time. And then mon months and months and months later, I think it was maybe a year and a half later, I went to the producer who is a friend, you know, a colleague and a friend. And I said, listen, I had this experience and she was mortified. And she said, you know, I'd like to have a larger conversation with you about this if you don't mind. And I said, no, I'd be happy to. And she was like, let's get a drink. And in the planning of it, it turned into six producers from that publisher because they all were so concerned about what had happened and wanted mm. to know how they could do better. Now, the positive, right, is that they all of their own volition joined, joined up and sat with me for three hours one night in a bar in New York where we all talked and, and got to, you know, they, they really plumbed the depths of the experiences that I had and they were great listeners and they instituted some policy changes after that um, that I have seen have to great effect. The negative side of that is that I had to ask for it. And so the risk, again, and the emotional burden was on me. And so to, to think about the kinds of check-ins that, that publishers and producers can be doing to make sure, especially, you know, a, another example is, you know, women doing, uh, you know, uh, or men, you know, people doing uh, sexually explicit content in audiobooks and having a director that they don't know well, or that they don't feel comfortable doing that material from, you know, there's a lot, there's so much emotional sensitivity. And I think that this, this moment right now where we're thinking about race and thinking about people's individuality, their humanity and their needs and how to care for each other. I think we can just be having a better conversation about it because as we all know, narration is lonely, it's isolating 
and it can be emotionally devastating at times, right? Mm -hmm. And yet it's just like, how'd it go? Great. Another one in the can. You know? mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that, and, and that is to say, PJ, that I think that our, our publishers and our producers are willing to have those conversations, more than willing to have those conversations. Um, but I think that there just needs to be attention paid uh, that narrators, of course, need to speak up when they can, but also because we are the people who are offered the job, right? We are the, the hiree in a, in a sense, uh, that, that as much responsibility and uh, awareness as can be taken on by the people who are making the offer of the job would be a positive, a very positive thing. That balance of power is always there, as we know, because as you say, we're the ones getting the job and you want to please, you want to please the employer and you don't exactly. want to be troublesome, as I think uh, the word you used before when you were concerned about the comment you had posted. Um, what, is, what is the action that could be taken? What could be done differently using your, your very example? Like if you, if you got to you know, take the control of the whole thing and have a redo, what would have made the difference? I mean, this, is, this goes back to, again, what, what Leon was saying, right? In, the, in that specific instance, it should not have been, it should not have been, I won't say it shouldn't have been a white woman directing that book, but it should not have been that white woman directing that book. Hmm. And, don't, by the way, without going into details or, or revealing anything you're uncomfortable with, we don't want that. Certainly, you know, no names or anything like that. But can you give us just a tiny bit of insight on what the actual problem was? I think you said it was an aesthetic thing, but clearly it involved race. Are you able to share with us what, what the problem for you uh, became in this environment? I'll say that the director was trying to push me to do certain types of voices for certain mm -hmm. things. Okay. And went so far as to play examples of those kinds of voices from YouTube. Just in case you'd never met Wow. Anything. Yes. Wow. That's kind of, it's almost like, here's a line reading. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and it wasn't about the, it wasn't about the intention of the lines, PJ, yeah. right? Yeah. Like it was worse than a line reading because a line reading, I know how to deal with, right? <laughs> like, no, it, it is, you're absolutely right. And, it it and literally is like, here's a caricature. It's, yeah. It's, it's, that's exactly it. Yeah. And, and, and as, a, as a black person, I'm sitting there doing what I feel is the most authentic and respectful version of this thing. Mm. And this white director is telling me, I'm wrong. That is simply not a conversation that should have even been allowed to happen, right? But in, in a sense that a director is a director and an actor is an actor, there's this hierarchy, right? So what's the problem? Well, how many directors of color of audiobooks? Fill up the chat, folks. How many black directors have you worked with? <laughs> right? I mean, there's a very tiny handful. I think I've worked with all of them. Um, I would say that upwards of 90, 95% of, of the directors I work with are white folks. And this is, again, as Leon was saying, you know, this is a publishing problem, right? Like we as audiobooks, as narrators, we are an arm of publishing. Now I'm going to say something really radical. If any of you who are white walked into a publishing house tomorrow and 98% of the people who worked there were black, would you feel that everything that you intended, wanted, thought, saw would have, would, would, would you automatically feel like you were safe and that was all going to be respected? Or would you feel otherized, right? So if you're asking me what I'd like to see, you know, I'd like to see a publishing house where 98% of the people look like me because my entire life has been spent, my entire career certainly, has been spent in spaces that were, you know, upwards of let's say 75, I'll be generous, percent white. And I'm not advocating for everyone who works in publishing to be fired that would be horrible right but what but where do where's the middle ground when do i get the kind of sense of comfort and security and uh it's not even camaraderie so much as it is sort of like instinctual understanding 
I mean, when I have to do that, and that's not the only time I've had to defend my position of how a character should sound to a white director. That's just the most egregious. But whenever I have to do it, I get nauseated. And you all know, I'm not, you know, some Johnny come lately. I'm a well-respected narrator with a lot of credits and a lot of acclaim. And to this day, yes, PJ, it's seven Audis now. See, <laughs> it was a I, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> to this day, I get a, 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 nause, a nauseous knot in my stomach when I have to turn to a white person, even a white person I know well that I've done dozens of books with, and I have to say, I think you're wrong on that. It's hard, man. It's hard. So You mean wrong not, about anything? Oh, 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 pertaining to race. Oh, specifically you know? pertaining to race. Okay. Yeah, wanna... pertaining to race. Yeah. Um, no, and that's the thing, right? Like, as directors and actors, like, that's a conversation about choices. That's a conversation I'll have all day long. I'll battle back and forth. Sometimes the director wins. Sometimes I win. Cool. No harm, no foul. That's the, right. the job. But when it comes to a white person trying to tell me that they know better what this person should sound like, I, it's painful, man. I don't know what to tell you. It's just painful. Um, so I'm interested in what you all think that you can do to make the world look more like, look somewhere between the world that I live in and the world I'm telling you I'd like to live in. Right. And I think there is work that everyone can do. You know, I think it, it, one thing that I, I, I heard someone talk about uh, earlier today, there was a, another, there was a SAG-AFTRA uh, a webinar. It was a panel of black actors in Hollywood and television and directors, and it was just great. And one of the things that someone was saying was, you know, where have you been until now? Right? That they have that question for a lot of their white friends and allies. Where have you been? Right? And, and it's such an interesting question because I, I'd like to ask it, but in a slightly different way, because I don't want to ask it to shame or to accuse, but I want to ask you where you've been till now, because unless you understand the answer to that question individually for each and every one of you, when this moment is over and it will end, this will end, COVID will end, it's all going to change again. Whatever was holding you back before, if you haven't answered that for yourself and figured it out, it's going to hold you back again. There will be recidivism. You have to figure out what it was, that, that what fear, what discomfort, what ignorance, you know, what old ideas, what experiences. Everybody has to excavate that for themselves. And when you get that answer, I think it'll be a lot easier to figure out what you can do. Because what everyone can do is different. Everybody has a different skill set. Everybody has different belief system. What everybody can do is different. But if everybody figures out what they can do and, and, and do it, that's it, man. That's the game. Yeah. Um, in, in doing some Googling around in the last few days, um, I found a lot of resources, like there was one, I think it was on Medium that had 75 things, 75 steps you can take as a white person if you want to be an ally. <laughs> and I mean, you know, it, it's, everything is unique and individual to the person, but um, there are steps you can take individually and within yourself and within your world. And even if it's just, I, you know what, I'm just, I'm expounding about something I don't know anything about. Never mind. I was going to say, even if it's just expanding your listening or expanding your viewing or something that makes a difference, but I, you it, know, I hope that makes a difference. Of course it, it does because it's something different, right? Like we're all, we're all guilty of wanting instant gratification, right? Likes, clicks, la la la, everything, streaming, everything now, now, now. And what a horrible, awful, terrible gift this COVID time has been that it has slowed so many of us down, Right. We've had to be alone with ourselves and our thoughts and our cats. My cat, it's amazing. And what have you. And it's like, yeah, it does start with that. It does start with reading differently, watching differently, thinking differently, meditating differently, approaching your own fear differently. Yes, I do think that's how it changes. That's how it starts. But you got to be brave. And you got to be willing to fail. You got to be willing to take on that risk. It, as Black people... <laughs> Failure for us can result in a bullet in the back of the head. 
you know, because we were scared because, uh, you know, I, people say don't resist. If I got arrested tomorrow, I don't know that I wouldn't resist. I'm a college professor, upper middle class, like, you know, all the, all the credentials, all the whatever. No, it doesn't matter. The color of my skin supersedes all of that. So a person makes a split second decision to break and run because they're so scared because they don't know what these cops are going to do to them and they end up with a bullet in their back. That's just one decision, right? So the risk that we take on making decisions every day, all the time, getting in the wrong elevator, you know, telling the, telling the woman in Central Park to put her dog on a leash, all of our decisions are risky. So if you can take on one or two risky decisions a week, yeah, I think that would really, really change it. I really think it would.